Thank you, Judy. Uh, and uh, yes, my name's Emily Dell. I am a filmmaker and screenwriter and scientist myself, but I'm also very proud to be here on behalf of ScreenCraft, which is a screenwriting education and talent discovery platform. We educate the next emerging generations of screenwriters with programs like you see here. Um, but actually, like Judy said, nothing like this has ever been done before. And so I am really excited to dive in. And so I'm gonna start with bios quickly for all of our panelists and then into questions. And we hope it just becomes a, a really interesting conversation between these incredible people sitting next to me. And yes, uh, uh, astronaut Sunita Williams will participate in the Q&A at the end. If anyone has any questions, they're willing to want to fire at her. So sitting to my right is filmmaker Michael Barnett, whose film is playing at 5 o'clock at, let's, pl let's plug the movie right now. Where? I don't know where, where? but it's playing. Where? <laughs> okay. Redfield? Redfield. Okay, Redfield, yes. And this is the film The Mars Generation, yep. which was at Sundance this past year and has screened at many other film festivals. And in addition to that, Michael Barnett is an Emmy Award-winning film filmmaker. He's traveled the world for HBO, National Geographic, Discovery, the BBC, and more. Uh, he, his first full-length film, the, the Emmy-nominated documentary Superheroes, was distributed by HBO, and in 2012, he created Gore Vidal, The United States of, of Amnesia, which premiered at, at, at Tribeca. And in 2015, he partnered with Morgan, Morgan Spurlock for Becoming Bulletproof, which was chosen by the U.S. State Department to screen in countries worldwide as part of our, the American Cultural Diplomacy Outreach. And The Mars Generation is his most recent film uh, that has garnered rave reviews, and I encourage everyone to go see it. To his left, your right, is Josh Seftel, who is the filmmaker in residence this year at the Woods Hole Film Festival. He directed War, Inc., starring John Cusack, Ben Kingsley, and Marissa Tomei. At age 22, he received his first Emmy nomination for his very first film, the award-winning Lost and Found. And the PBS broadcast of Lost and Found <clears throat> helped thousands of Romanian orphans get adopted and raised uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for their cause. He's also directed Emmy award-winning premiere of a premiere season of the groundbreaking Bravo series, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, and the PBS Peabody Awards finalist documentary series, The Secret Life of Muslims. His stories have been on This American Life, essays on NPR, Salon, CBS, and CBS Sunday Morning. All right. Nice. Then, then to Josh's left is Kay Foster, uh, officially Nora Kay Foster, but known, at, known to us as Kay. Uh, an extremely accomplished television writer, executive producer, and what we call showrunner in Hollywood parlance. Uh, her, she and her longtime writing partner, Adam Armas, uh, created and executive produced NBC's American Odyssey. Before that, they were executive producers on the Fox series, The Following, and they spent several years with an overall deal at Universal where they ran the hit series, Heroes. They started their careers working their way up through three David E. Kelly shows and are currently developing a series based on the comic book series, Sinatoro? The Sinatra. Sinatra for Amazon Studios. And interestingly, before that, she had a whole career as an educator and marketing executive. <laughs> so next to Kay is Doug Young, who is a screenwriter and graduate of NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. His first feature was Confidence, starring Ed Burns and Dustin Hoffman. He's written extensively for television and film, including HBO's Big Love. He's the co-creator of TNT's Dark Blue. And he wrote the Star Trek film, uh, this film Star Trek Beyond, directed by Justin Lin, which was his second project with J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot. He recently completed production on the TV pilot Scalped, based on an acclaimed DC and Vertigo graphic novel. <clears throat> All right, you guys. Julie Hoover <laughs> no is Emmy. sitting next to Doug Young. <laughs> this is the no Emmy side. No Emmy's over no. here. No Emmy's here. No, no Emmy. Uh, so uh, as you guys may see, we have organized the panel slightly into documentarians, writers, and then scientists. And so we start with uh, the incredible Julie Hoover, who is a, an associate scientist of marine chemistry and geochemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic. She investigates sub-seafloor microbial com communities to resolve the function, evolutionary dynamics, and biogeochemical implications of this unexplored ecosystem. The questions that her work addresses are universal for understanding the impact of microbial life on both human and planetary health. 
and help us understand the diversity of life on Earth and beyond. She works with NASA and also serves as Associate Director of the NSF Science and Technology Center for Dark Energy Biosphere Investigations, whose mission is to explore life beneath the seafloor sea to advance science, benefit society, and inspire the general public. And then next to Julie is <laughs> Ken Bissler, the Senior science, Scientist of Marine Chemistry and Geochemistry, also at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And his research focuses on upper ocean biogeochemical cycles, studies of scavenging and particle cycle, cycling using anthropogenic and naturally occurring <laughs> radionucleotides, and geochemical studies of the Black Sea using Chernobyl radio tracers, pl plutonium IC, uh, isotopes, and the behavior of fallout plutonium <laughs> in the ocean in the aftermath of the Sh Fukushima reactor. <laughs> <laughs> right? Hi. <laughs> so, then my hard job is done. <laughs> All right, and so now let's get to the fun stuff. Um, honestly, I don't know if I need this mic because it seems like there's only one and the rest of us can just talk, right? Uh, you guys can yeah. just, um, So, I'd like to start with inspiration, which I think as... We actually need the mic. We actually need it, so everybody has to talk it, so we have to pass it down. No, we're all mic. We're mic. Oh, so just me. Okay, great. All right, sorry about that. Um, uh, so starting with inspiration, which is, I think, um, inspiration and imagination is what brings us all here to this film festival. I'd like to ask each of our panelists to name a show, a TV show or film or any piece of popular entertainment or that ever inspired them um, about the world and, and inspired curiosity to learn more. And this could be science, it could be science fiction, or for or if there wasn't anything like that in entertainment for you, um, or if, if there was ever something that really captured your imagination and, and made you more curious about the world. Who wants to dive in? <laughs> for me, it was a book. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it was a book connected to Woods Hole, which was Rachel Carson's The Sea Around oh, Us. Yeah, good book. Um, and she wrote it just sitting down the street. There's a statue of where she sat when she wrote it. And I read it when I was 11 year old living in Chicago, <laughs> and it captured my imagination and thinking about this ocean that I rarely got to see. So it helped move this path, and I love being able to go hang out with Rachel and you know, do my science here. Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anybody young enough that do does not remember Twilight Zone? <laughs> so you know, it, it was all about the fringe areas of science, and I've really been involved in television writing, I've really been involved in the pseudosciences more than the actual hard sciences. I never wrote for CSI and all of that, but I love science, and I love the fact that we're focusing on science more these days, and um, I think it's an integral part to our, to our writing process, actually. So. For me it was, um, I, I grew up um, with uh, reading disability, and um, when I would go to the, the public library in Schenectady, New York, with my dad and my sisters, they would get my sisters would get all these books, and I would get stacks of VHS tapes of documentaries. And so for me, it was the documentary films, and just that was my entry point into learning and into um, discovering the world, and ultimately it became part of my career. I think mine was like a little bit of protest. I, well, is my mic different than everyone else's? Sounds like, anyway, uh, when I was a kid, I grew up here in New Hampshire, and there was sort of no potential uh, film school that I could think of, certainly not at the state level, and I went to UNH, and, um, and I think I had a proclivity for science and mathematics and sort of just tested into always studying science and mathematics, but I didn't really love it. <laughs> and, uh, and when I went to UNH, I, I studied biology and human genetics and uh, environmental affairs, uh, always knowing that I was not going to do anything with it, that I was going to go out to Los Angeles and be a filmmaker. <laughs> but strangely, you know, uh, I mean, I just spent the last three years doing nothing but, uh, you know, studying science and making a film about it. Nice. So it all kind of came together nice. in the end. Yeah. That's good. Uh, for me, I, it was probably TVs and TV shows and movies and... Um, I remember younger watching Star Trek in reruns and uh, uh, having, that having an impact on me that I probably didn't quite understand until later. And then 
I, this later in life, I remember watching Blade Runner for, for the first time on VHS. And that's where I sort of realized that this, this idea of science and, and fiction uh, uh, could uh, kind of uh, uh, lead to these bigger questions um, ultimately about humanity and who we are and what, what we are as a species. And that idea that in Star Trek even that sort of the, the farther we go out, the more we're actually examining what's inside. And I always sort of felt that that was this incredible uh, uh, combination of two um, great things, which is analytical uh, uh, science and then um, a sort of more philosophical humanistic kind of uh, exploration. Yeah, you know, this introduction, I study things that are radioactive in the ocean, and when I look back, I didn't think at the time, but some of those 60s grainy black and white B-movies, the Godzillas, them, <laughs> all the strange <laughs> things that happen when you're radioactive, I think that combined with watching things like Jacques Cousteau documentaries and kind of put them together eventually, but I didn't know that, but somehow that must have influenced me, because that's where I am now. Yeah. <laughs> you almost have like the real life Godzilla going on. <laughs> right? So is there anything that, that you think, like what was it about these stories that grabbed you? Was it character? Was it something you didn't know before? Well, uh, Twilight Zone, it's an easy thing to talk about because the thing that grabbed me was the kind of morality tale that would be told during each episode. So it would start off with a narration and it would tell us about who the person was and, and it would say to us that all of a sudden that little world is about to change and then it would create this anticipation for you. It was like so exciting. What, what's going to happen to this person? And just the, the thrill of that I think was really exciting. Plus it always played out as kind of a morality tale, um, which I think is interesting. A good guys versus bad guys. And uh, looking inside, which is what Doug said. There's also, I think, for uh, me, for the, the element of science and how it's represented, at least the way I respond to it, as opposed to like science fantasy, which arguably you could say is Star Wars and that kind of stuff, which I'm a big fan of, so I'm going to get upset, <laughs> um, is the idea that you know, you're, you're asked in movies and, and uh, popular mediums like that to, to, uh, to engage in a subjective reality. And you sort of have to suspend your disbelief to a certain extent. And, and whenever there's something, like in Twilight Zone or other things that I like, there's this element of science that feels plausible or maybe even real. And to me, that just adds to the experience of watching a movie or watching television and going, oh, that, that, that's a possibility that feels <laughs> a little bit more real than something that's full-blown, right. you know, just fantasy. So. I always sort of, uh, you know, if you're a storyteller of some kind, that it's another little kind of like thing you can grab onto and hold onto and, and feels um, like you relate to that. I think scientists and storytellers are very much alike because we all ask the question, what if? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that unites our, us, the imagination, to answer that what if question. And science too, if, if I think it, if you're sort of, if you're, sharing a story of science uh, in a way, I mean, sort of my relationship with science from a storytelling perspective, the kind of deeper I go, the less I share something that is, you know, analytical or factual, whatever it may be, it, it's actually the, the deeper I go into whatever I'm sort of um, trying to understand, the more I understand me and the more I understand sort of the human side of the story I'm trying to share. So it is, a, I think there's a, a, a perfect marriage, right, of the deeper you go when you think about sort of science or space or whatever it may be, the, the more humanistic your story is going to be, so. When, when I, um, one of the films that I found in that library was called The Times of Harvey Milk. Has anyone seen that mm -hmm. film? Yeah. And I remember that was the moment when I realized that, like, what, first of all, what good storytelling is and how a documentary can have, um, a, a documentary can have this underdog protagonist that you can follow through a part of history. And in some ways, I feel like every time I do, do a science story, I think about that film and I think about, to me, scientists often are underdogs. You know, they're people who are working 
in the shadows, not always, but often working in the shadows, doing something that people don't really understand. They're usually questing for some, to discover something or to understand something better. And, um, and that's such a um, valiant thing to do. And, um, and, and I think that any kind of, if you can tell that kind of underdog story in the right way, it's really compelling. And so science stories can be fantastic because of that. I think it's an interesting point because in a way it's like uh, uh, science in, in, in the broadest sense might be like a search for truth, right? And, and that idea of like you have to navigate or cut through prejudice, uh, uh, religion, like sort of all these things, po politics to get to it. And it's, you're asking so much of people to, to not adhere to those things that they've learned in some other way and say, well, this is actually <laughs> the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're seeing that play out every day um, now uh, with climate change and stuff like that. But it's probably why it's like so challenging in a way to, to, to or why you, you would almost say it's an underdog thing, where it's on a sort of objective level, you would say, well, why is that an underdog story? This is people looking for the actual factual truth of something. Mm -hmm. So, I think yeah. the underdog kind of resonates to me a bit. You know, they're never the, the star, but they're the ones who solve the big problem right. in 90 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever the show is. So it kind of, it's fun to think about, you know, the impact you can have without being up front and center. Mm -hmm. right. I guess that just fit my personality yeah. better. <laughs> and the Literally take home though now is, you know, it's not that easy, right? Yeah. right. You right. learn that right. you just don't answer those questions in 30 or yeah. 60 minutes. Yeah. Right. And is it, a, 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 I read somewhere where somebody said that Good science means really what you've done is you've just posed the next set of questions, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's no kind of clean bow, we're done. Right. Let's lock that away and call it a day, right? That would be a terrifying feeling to run out of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time to just sail away. So how important is communication of science? And I'd like to start with, um, with Julie and Ken on this, uh, both to educate the public, to inspire the next generation. I, I mean, I think it's, critically important and um, you know Twitter has changed my life as a science communicator for example um, social media and it's been nothing but positive positive. Um, and not only do I feel like I get to communicate with a lot more people because now we can use things like social media or sometimes when we're at sea we can even stream video back live so some, anyone can pop up on their laptop to YouTube and they can okay. see what we're doing on the sea floor and you know, the comments and questions. We get questions like, is this Earth? You know, I mean, it's that fantastic, right? These exploding volcanoes or molten lava, you know, are, is this Mars? You know, those are the types of questions we get. And it's, it's amazing, right, to be able to share that experience outside of, you know, these 50 people sitting on a ship who, while still amazing, you know, we, we get to see it a lot. We get to participate. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also think it helps to show the different faces of science, the different, I mean, I'm, I think it's amazing you guys think we're heroes because no one has ever said that before. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I think, you know, bringing together people who are professional storytellers with scientists, it's, you know, it's a wonderful path forward. <laughs> my dog thinks I'm a hero. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. But communications, you know, I think when you start out, at least for me as a scientist, you're automatically talking to your peers right away. You're talking to others, and that's how you advance what you're doing. But I think more and more as time went on, I realized that in some ways it's sometimes more satisfying way to get that out to a public that should be hearing this. Because you can sit in your office, you can do wonderful things, and you can get credit for it, maybe not be called a hero. But ultimately, I feel like my job is to help move something forward that people care about. And how will they know if I just write a, a treaties and geochemical, cosmochemical octa, you know, you're not going to see that. So we've gone into things like uh, crowdfunding as a way to engage people to take samples. Once they grab that water and send it to me for radioactivity levels, they want to know what does it mean and stuff. And so I think there are now new things coming out that allow us to reach those audiences. And obviously that's changed a lot in the last decade or so. I think they're being nice down there. Uh, truth and science are under attack. I think now more than ever it is imperative True. to put stuff into the world that makes a difference, that perpetuates truth. Uh, I mean, I couldn't be more proud of the fact that we have made a film that advocates for science, it advocates for exploration, it advocates for space, and more importantly, it advocates for the education of our youth. So I think communicating this is uh, of the utmost <laughs> importance right now. I mean, I
in a way, marketing needs, science needs marketing. Yeah, I, really I didn't need marketing. I didn't know a single scientist growing up. I never I, met I, a I scientist until scientists. I went to until college. Until I met you guys. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so if you're not, if you don't even... If you're not in the community, right, you're, if you're not, not seeing the them on the screen or reading about them in books or meeting them, right. you know, how are you... I didn't even know, I didn't know I wanted to be a scientist. I knew I wanted to understand how the ocean worked. Right. Right? Like, I didn't get it. I wanted to understand how it worked. It turned out to do that, I had to be a scientist. Um, and so I think the more we can expose the public to scientists, the better. When yeah. uh, several years ago, I was making a, a film about um, cancer researchers at MIT. And I was meeting these and interviewing these amazing people who were having like major breakthroughs in, in find, searching for the cure for cancer. And some of them had won Nobel Prizes and, and all kinds of um, incredible crazy. awards. And I, I looked at this list of people that I'd met and I had never heard of any of them. Right. I didn't know anything about them. Um, never heard their name before. Didn't know about their work. And then I was thinking, I was like, but I know, like, I think I know what kind of iced tea Kim Kardashian likes to drink. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that that was so upsetting to me when that that moment uh, that I realized that. And that's when I actually, I pitched a series to Nova on PBS, this a digital series called The Secret Life of Scientists. And I said, I want to I want to tell yeah. stories about scientists that you've never heard before. I want to know about their lives. I want to know about their hobbies. I want to know about very personal details. I want to humanize them. I want to create a set of films that will serve to um, provide people, like younger people, like to With look and say, models. like role models, and say, like, oh, right. look at that person. They're like me, or or they're doing this thing, and that's really interesting. And I see the human side right. of them. And and so and so for the last seven years, we've been making this series, um, and it's um, we've made. Uh, over 300 short films now that are out on the web and are free to watch. And um, you know we've had, I think, over 50 million views um, and have gotten some really nice letters from kids who've been inspired. And, it's really um, nice. But it's, it's, there, that's just one drop in the bucket. Um, you know, I think there needs to be more going on by people like you and um, you know, making films that tell science stories in a way that um, are inspiring, accessible, um, and provide role models and an understanding of mm -hmm. what, what it means to be a scientist. And so what's the series again? It's called The Secret Life of Scientists. Life. It's part of the NOVA okay. strand. Yeah. Right. Uh, because I think that you know, we're hoping that this panel kind of sparks something that you know, continues that's maybe an initiative or, or, or if nothing else, new relationships, what can we all be doing how, how can we be better working together to communicate these issues? Meeting one another is a good start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm always looking for great stories. I mean, all, all storytellers are. I'm sure that yeah, everyone from absolutely. the middle down yeah. is, is looking for inspiration wherever they can find it. So yeah, any line of communication that gets open between a scientific community and a storyteller is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So One thing I've noticed, and, and you guys could probably speak to this better, but is that when I started producing, I produced things for Nova, and when I started out, a lot of the scientists I met were reluctant to, to make their science too accessible, um, and they spoke about it in a, in a very jargony way that I couldn't understand, and um, not all of them, but some. And, and I would always say, that I, I, you don't know how many times I've said this line, speak to me as if, as if I'm in fifth grade. Can you do that? for me, because that will make this, this film better. And I know that's insulting in a way um, to scientists, but it's, it's a start, you know? Um, and it's a, way, it's a way to begin the conversation and to present the information to the general public. And um, It's almost not their job, though, to make it accessible. It's yours. Well, right, yeah. that's true. But I've noticed that more and more, it's, and I don't, I don't know if the culture is changing. You guys can speak to this, but I feel like the culture is changing from what I've seen, where scientists are more interested in people like me when they come to them, and they're they're more interested in finding a way to make their their content accessible, their their work accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems like a fairly new thing. I think I feel like it was almost frowned upon to talk to the um, to the sort of pop media about your work. But now it seems like it's okay a little bit. I don't. Maybe you guys can speak to that. Yeah, I think sometimes there's this line where you're afraid, 
you're afraid of how it's going to be um, perceived. perceived mm -hmm. in the media, right? Okay. And like they get it wrong, yeah. and then and that, you know, I've had some angry people call me, mm -hmm. and that that's uncomfortable. But I do think, um, you know, I see it with our grad students and and such. You know, they're really interested in science communication. They want training in it. You know, I've taken a couple trainings. Alan Alda's Center for mm -hmm. Science Communication did a one-day workshop with his group, um, you know, and I don't think it's insulting to say talk like I'm a fifth grader because if I can't convince a fifth grader that life at the bottom of the ocean is important, I'm never going to convince anybody, right? And these are the future taxpayers, these are the future protectors right. of our planet, right? And so <clears throat> I think I have to be able to talk to anybody about my science, whether it's Ken or you guys or or elementary school students, and I do think we could serve as better mentors if we were better trained in it. Um, and so some of those are really kind of volunteer opportunities we've taken on, um, but I think for future generations, there is, a, I see a little more access to formal training, which is helpful. Yeah, and it's not usually, you know, part of the job description, I think, Absolutely. is what kept us away from all your promotions, right? It's not about talking to public audiences that gets you tenure at a place like Woodsell Oceanographic Institution. Right. So there's that history too, that well, why would you do this? Uh, maybe there's a little more incentive now just because I think a higher fraction of funding comes from foundations, from individual donors, from a public that's eager to contribute in any way they can sometimes. So that's kind of shifted a bit too. So I think we have an incentive. I think we should have that self-motivation, but there's also you know, the reality that we're not seeing big budget increases in Washington, D.C. anytime soon. And, you know, if you want to convince other people that what you do is important, that, that's our obligation, too. I mean, and meeting people like you to help make that case is part of that. I think we can read into the panel, making science sexy through uh, marketing and media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, I got in trouble for using, calling something sexy in science. like. Mm -hmm. yeah. People were not, I called the Alvin submersible. I said diving in it is, it's, you know, the sexiest thing out there in science. And I got in <laughs> trouble. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, besides being an astronaut, <laughs> you know, traveling to the right. sea floor in a submarine, it's pretty darn sexy. Pretty cool. But pretty I was cool. scolded. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. That seems I, sexy. <laughs> I'd like to talk to, and I, I want to start this with um, with Michael and Josh, but anyone can jump in. Um, when, so when you're depicting something that is grounded in real science, how important is research, and what's your process? It's everything. Research and journalism is how I approach everything. And then it's my job to sort of, uh, you know, put it through the sausage grinder, spit it out so it's accessible and entertaining and cinematic, uh, and, but truthful. I mean, you know, whoever's coming to our film later, it is dense. I feel like the science part, I mean, it's, it's important, but in some ways that's the easy part. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the trying to break through um, to get to know the scientists and to get them to open up as a person, um, to get them to, like I always like to figure out how do I get inside their head? How do I? I just got inside someone's head. That was, that's what it sounds like. Um, and, uh, and that's how you do it. <laughs> I've got to um, use a needle now. <laughs> um, you know, how, I want to know, the, I wanna know their, their thought process. I want to know, like, how do you, like, how, how do you attack a problem? How, what goes through your mind? How do you find the inspiration? How do you, what do you feel like when you have that aha moment? Um, and so, like, I... You know, like I've discovered, like one story I did, um, the guy talked to me about how he just, he, when he's thinking, he just paces all the time. He's just pacing back and forth and back and forth. And then he has these breakthroughs. And what, he's, this is the guy who discovered um, CAPTCHA. Do you know what CAPTCHA is? It's when you type those little, when you're going into a website and you have to type in those little numbers. And, um, and so, um, you know, so when I told his story on film, he was pacing the entire 
time. And, I, and so there was a visual of, of getting inside his head. You know, another guy talked to me about how he, every day he varies his routine. So he'll, one day he'll wake up and he'll brush his teeth, and then he washes his face, and then he makes coffee. Um, and then the next day, he does it in a different order. And that's how he um, keeps his mind fresh. And then he gets these ideas when he's doing that. And, and so we, in that film, we had him brushing his teeth. And every day, he did it in a different order. And you always saw that. And, and I feel like finding those little quirks, those little human details that let us inside someone's thought process um, really help to tell the stories um, and help to let us into the human part of science and, and the creative process of doing science, because I think it is a, crea a creative endeavor in some ways. And, um, and so I always, that's the part I find to be the most challenging. And I, I love discovering that part of it and figuring out how to, how to tell that part of it. I find that kind of interesting, because I never think the story is really about us. It's about what we've discovered, right? But I can see your point if you're trying to convey that, get someone energized. But that's not normally how we think. So. Right. Uh, I have the, uh, a slightly different uh, experience with research and stuff. And, and I've done a, a few things that have science fiction, and they require uh, a consultation with scientists. And I think one of the things that happens in Hollywood, anyway, is that there is this kind of desire to, to have that research and have that scientific uh, accuracy. But, you know, for what we do in a strictly more narrative sense, you're often trying to get that stuff to bend into what you need it to yeah. be. So. It's the servant to the story. Right. <laughs> and I think part of the problem why, like, a lot of people who I know who are uh, 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 into science and accuracy, you know, they always say, well, why would you do that? Because that, that, that would never happen. <laughs> and of course not. But there is a, a, a sort of desire for that you see on all levels. I'm talking like studios and, you know, the sort of uh, uh, the, the machinations of how movies get made, where that quickly gets sidelined by the billion other factors that kind of come right. in. <clears throat> so I think too often mm -hmm. there's this desire for that in the sort of early stages where you can kind of say, tell me, like a fifth grader, how this would happen. And it all gets laid out, and you're good until point 10, <clears throat> where you go, OK, that destroys the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you end up trying to, uh, I mean, I've been on the other side of the table where I find myself going, yeah, but what if that happened, is that, and it's funny, you see this negotiation that I've had experiences with other scientists where they kind of go, you see the kind of their bullshit meter, like right. doing this <laughs> constantly, you know? And like you, you sort of can tell that if you're like around there, they're okay with that. But if you go to that, they're like, listen, we can't, I, I no longer want to have lunch Don't put with my you. name yeah, on the Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's a little bit of having the, uh, uh, setting the, um, designing the sort of vessel for all of that, uh, the story to, to say it's necessary that we keep this amount of accuracy. Um, otherwise, it kind of just becomes an exercise and, and sort of it's no hold barred <clears throat> and you, know, you sort of have yeah. any, anything can sort of go. But, uh, so I think that's one thing that for mo in movies and television shows, like, yeah, we can all be a little bit better at that communicating those, the desire for it, it to have that accuracy and, mm -hmm. and consulting more with people who really know what they're talking about um, and not just kind of going like, but you know, we need an asteroid to hit Earth and it needs to happen next year. You know, like it's that, that kind of, how do they not know it's gonna hit Earth? Um, so it's, it's sort of all those like little things that I think just the, the, so there's some responsibility to say, at least for the strictly fiction stuff like, all right, we're going to try to air a little bit more towards that. So. There's a good side, a downside, and a good side to that. And the good side is that by writers showing women doing science, like detective work and forensics, the numbers have gone up in grad school and in schools for all of the uh, women participating in forensic science 
from television writing. So that's the mm -hmm. good side of the, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, no DNA comes back overnight. We all know that. But <laughs> nevertheless, uh, in television it does, and things happen much more quickly. Uh, the same is true, I must say, my writing partner and I did a lot of legal shows. And the same is true with legal shows, which is that we tell the, the audience how to think about the law. And then when they go into the courtroom, they're expecting that like on the OJ case, mm -hmm. where they expect a certain level of fictionalized you know, uh, exhibits. And uh, it's, so it gums the works up in, in many ways, on the good side and on the bad side. Yeah. There's also a little bit, I think, how science is depicted in, 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 in a lot of Hollywood things that like, we're not helping the cause. No, <laughs> absolutely you know, not. You think about right. it, it's like, the scientists are either, the tropes are, they're either like, the mad genius who's going to destroy one. the world, right, right. or yeah. he's the guy in the back going, "I'm telling you, that's not how it's going to happen." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, like, how it's, the, it's like the age-old argument. You know, I, I, when I when I found out I was going to be on the panel, I kept thinking about Ray uh, Ray Bradbury's short story, which I couldn't find. And if I'm wrong about this, correct me. But there was a story where he, a man was sitting on a train and he had a wristwatch on, and on that and that wristwatch he could talk to his wife on the phone. And that was written in the 50s, the 60s, or whatever. And I thought, that will never happen. That's crazy. <laughs> so you know, it's like the invention of things comes about because scientists do the hard work. But some of it comes about because the ideas are out there. Sure. And that gives them a goal to reach for and a, and a thing to, to hit, a target to hit. Yeah, so. I was going to add on to your comment about this place. And you know, I can put Bullshit up with a, what I said. Yeah, I can put up with a, a lot of BS for a good story, but I do think that having um, science represented in a more diverse manner, even if it's a bunch of BS, would be more helpful, right? right. So you know, women are all often portrayed as a little bit neurotic or like a little bit too sexy or something. You know, there's some right. weird little little place that their men get a much fuller range, it right. appears. The, the, um, the, 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 the pinnacle of that was in a Bond movie when the, the actress Denise Richards played a <laughs> nuclear physicist. <laughs> 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 like, the casting yeah. there, not yeah. quite right. Right. So I think, you know, even in science fiction and science fantasy, you know, filling those roles, right. you know, with more different colors and genders and, and races would, would right. help a lot. Which well, is happening. We, yeah. were, we were talking about that. But yeah. also just the depiction of you know, there's a, you know, again, this is a little bit, I'm speaking a little bit in cliche, but that idea of like, there's, in popular entertainment, there seems to be this idea of like, like, let's dumb everything down to the lowest common denominator so that the broadest spectrum of people can understand ex precisely what we're right. talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, take the movie like uh, The Martian, which for every, I was impressed with the movie just in the sense that they didn't really care to, to stop and explain. Yeah every little detail of the chemical components of this, that, and the other. Or I should say, when they did, they didn't stop to say, time out. Now let's put in layman's terms for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So. The film has good science. Yeah. I thought it was it a does, love right? song to science. Yeah. I was going to say, I hope you're not you know, denigrating the science there, <laughs> no, because I thought it was real. I thought it was real. No, good. but it's, uh, it's, 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 again, it's saying, we're going to embrace that in this way. And if you keep, can keep up, great. But if you can't, maybe we'll pique your curiosity enough to go look it up or something. Right. Or on another sense, like what I was talking about before, it adds a level of, of um, reality to the situation that just helps you immerse more and engage more and become more sort of invested in the actual story. Sure. So, you know, it's like to me that's a good example of yes. how it can be represented in but a I kind think of the moment. Martian's a good example of actually having good science because everybody can then get on board with the film knowing that it looks a lot like how it's going to look. Yeah. So then it makes it, I don't know, I think more compelling, emotional, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So science can serve a story in that way. Right. And right. And enhance the experience. Right. I'm curious for you guys, like, just, I was thinking about this, like, what, do you guys go to often go to movies and you just sit there and you're shaking your head the whole time? Mm -hmm. You know, I've never watched Sharknado, but that's on the other side. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> in the room. Oh, when New York freezes over and the wolves come out and, like, what, yeah. Three hours or whatever. Ooh, day after tomorrow. I love that movie. There's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely a few that go way beyond yeah. my uh -huh. bullshit meter, but right. The Martian is a great one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then if it's if they come out being fantastic, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, I don't know. If it's if it's a fun movie that might have some elements, that's okay. 
Yeah. Right. Do you, I, do you, I, oh, Go I, I just cringe when they get things like totally wrong. There was a Mars movie many years ago that got the genetic code wrong, which is ATGC. <laughs> they got the fourth one wrong. Out of four, they got yeah. it wrong? Oh, and, wow. They got it wrong. That right? were maybe 16 screenwriters. So I, I just. I right. think it, Three out of four is not bad. That's, what, <laughs> that's acceptable to Hollywood, yeah. <laughs> that's acceptable, right? <laughs> two out of two is acceptable. They're like, wait, so it's 75%? We're good with that. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have Sophie jobs with that, right? Them, huh? no. um, so I think there is that, that, that place between not trying to tell them too much, right, right or, or just getting all in. So I loved The Martian. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was practically in tears. I thought, oh, you know, watching the engineers at the Jet Propulsion Lab try to figure this right. out, like, how are we going to do this? I thought it was incredibly compelling. Right. And how dramatic that it you can so say, dramatic. we have to figure out this algorithm. Yeah. And everybody goes, oh my God, it's life and death. And right. it feels as, you know, sort of urgent and, and, yeah. and, and dramatic yeah. as, yeah. you know. I thought it was great. So I, I grew up in a, in a family where my father was a physician. And when we would watch St. Elsewhere or Quincy or whatever, like he would just sit there and he'd be like, that's totally bullshit. That's wrong, <laughs> that's wrong, that's wrong. And, and I just wonder, like, I'm curious to hear from you guys, like how to, like as a documentary guy, when I do documentary, I'm always pushing it as far toward like drama as yeah. I can. Like I'm trying to use the conventions of movies, uh, Hollywood movies to tell my stories, but I always have to tell the truth. So I'm, I'm constrained by that, but how do you guys, can, can it be brought, like how can you guys improve the genre of science in movies? Um, how can you do it better so that, you know, it's still really compelling, right. um, but it's accurate or close to accurate? Well, I, I can only speak from my experience, but certainly like a movie like Star Trek is a, is a, a further out and again, like, Trekkies are people you don't want to get on the wrong side of. <laughs> so there's a kind of more, but there's a little more leeway there, you know, like, you can understand that. But um, I think one of the things, I'm doing a project now that's based on uh, uh, a real life person and it's about privatized space. And uh, the, the, sci the engineers I've spoken to, they give it to you and they give you the naked sort of facts. And it's like what you were saying, which is like, you do have to put it through a little bit of a sausage grinder to go, it's going to be, you know, like on some level, it starts to become abstract because you just don't understand all of those things. But if you can distill it down into something that's digestible and real, and even if it's just a sense of that seems accurate, it's not too neat, it's not mm -hmm. too tidy, it's not too uh, uh, sort of um, um, uh, uh, just sort of convenient that it's th that. I think that helps, I, you know. I think there's another thing too, though, where it's like, at least this is my experience, so I'm not. Okay. You tend to do a lot of research in the beginning, like in the sort of blue sky, anything's possible, this is gonna right. be the greatest thing ever stage. But when you end up with a thing, I don't, I don't know a lot of people who go, <clears throat> dear sir, scientist, could you read this now and point out all the mistakes? Yeah. Because not going to happen, right? That, and that, I think that's actually sort of a little bit of a, a mistake. You yeah, know? I think that's yeah, something that, that could. Very, I mean, our film had to go through fact checker time magazine. Yeah, so it's yeah. A very different process. You're into education so. more. I mean, yeah. you know, actual fact based It'd education. Be nice to be able to, uh, We're into <laughs> fantasy entertainment, yeah. popcorn, mm -hmm. eating, right. dark it's, theater, it's, yeah. going. It's no excuse though, in the sense that it really is our jobs. If the commitment is to that. The powers that be, the, 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 again, the millions of people who come in and, and voice their opinions on these things as they're getting made, it really is, though, sort of our, it's one of our things where we have to sort of stand up and say, yes. I'm building a wall around this because mm -hmm. it just like, uh, uh, I don't believe that father would say that to his son. I don't believe any, in any world that science would hold up. Right, right, right. right, right. And so, you know, it, it, it sort of has to be adopted into that sort of um, realm of they're all things that have to feel right and, and, and help the story along. Um, or else, right. yeah, yeah, we've always done, I mean, well, maybe, maybe not, maybe it's just me. I've certainly written things where I've been like, I can't get behind that 100% <laughs> because yes. I'm, right. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, being accommodating to somebody else's desire right. or whatever so the thing is. The and thing you have to know about writing for television and writing for features, it's very collaborative. 
And so you don't actually have the final say. I mean, even in television, you don't have the final say. Mm. And of course, in features, you don't because the director's the person who has the final say. So, you know, a lot Sometimes of things. Sometimes not even uh, him Not or even yeah. him or her, maybe the studio or, you know, right. yeah, exactly. So we, don't, we only have so much control over things. But I like, to, I, I like to be accurate if I can. I like to, you know, I like to, I think it's important to educate people when they watch things, that they can learn something, because I think that's part of what I like. What I enjoy about life is learning new things. So uh, if possible, for sure. But if it's strictly a kind of a fantasy thing, it's hard other than, you know, uh, doing the psychology of the characters and working with human emotions to, um, to bring those to the fore. Ken and Julie, is there something that you wish, that, other than, you know, let's, let's get the genetic code correctly, <laughs> correct, uh, nice. is there something that you guys wish that uh, was communicated better, um, like it, you know, or something that you often see, like, it would be an easy fix, or something that, we, that you'd, you'd really like, that, that a, a spotlight isn't shined on in a way that you feel like it should be? One thing that when people see Chasing Coral, so I know a few people were there yesterday, the scientific oh, process, it's not just about facts, mm -hmm. did you get the facts right, but just this idea that they were working to take pictures, photographs on the water of coral bleaching in real time, and they made these fancy instruments and they didn't work. And that's a very common experience. They didn't give up, they went on, but it wasn't, it often seems to be you know, lacking that in, in a very short period of time, <coughs> you get to the end result. And I think that whole process of You've got a question, how are you going to answer it? You go down a, many more paths that right. don't really provide the answer than you do that gets you where you want to be. And working that, and I think that movie did a good job of just showing that, and that became part of the drama in some ways of that film, was showing things don't always work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not because we don't mm -hmm. try, it's because yeah. you don't know. I hear it's really good. Is it good? I hear it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I think something that also is sometimes missing for me is my science is really personal. Like, it's a very emotional thing for me. You know, like, I have wanted to study the ocean my entire life. I take it very seriously, but, and I take it home with me. I wake up with it. And I feel like sometimes the emotion, you know, and how personal it is, is taken out of a lot of these stories. And it sounds like you're trying to bring it back in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate that because, you know, I, I don't know how many movies or documentaries I've seen about the struggling actor, you know, trying to make it, you know, all this rejection and failure and all these things and then the final success. But, you know, that, that happens in every career, you know, and just because we're fact-based, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't mean there isn't this, this very emotional connection to it. And I think, you know, especially, um, it, especially in Woods Hole, right? I mean, we've all committed our, our lives to the ocean or, you know, um, understanding it. And for many of us, that's very personal. When your research is very cutting edge, as it is for both of you and a lot of what's done at, at HUI, how much, um, how, when are, are you ever asking what if in the same way that, that writers do? Are you ever kind of pushing your own imagination forward? Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about the writers, but. I mean, that's kind of what you're always trying to figure out ways to answer things that no one else has done, right? I mean, I don't want to sound too grand about this because they're often really small steps, small improvements in yeah. one technique or chemical analysis gets you a little bit closer. You know, the aha moments are rare. For me, it's more when you put all that stuff together that you can reach those moments. But, you know, you're being asked to support yourself by asking, answering questions that haven't been answered, at least in a research environment. So that is there all the time. And you don't, you know, like you said, going home, I mean, this is the kind of thing, I'm glad I love my job because as my wife will tell you, I'm <laughs> thinking about things all the time, late at night in the morning, you know, just it's not something you turn off and go home and do something else, it's, it's there. Yeah, and I think for me working, um, being willing to take the calls from the popular media has made me push my imagination because they will easily ask those questions, you know. <laughs> so what does that mean for finding life on Enceladus? And I'll be like, okay, we're going right there. <laughs> you know, this paper that was about, you know, extreme microbes on Earth, now we're going to go talk about life on Saturn's moon. And, and that's really fun though, right? And that mm -hmm. is part of what inspired me to stay in science and especially to go into the deep ocean, which is not an easy place to work. But it was thinking about, you know, the really big questions. Are we alone in the universe? You know, if we aren't alone, how are we gonna figure it out? You know, and what are we gonna do here to help us figure it out? And what is it gonna mean? Like these are really, really big questions. Um, 
and, and they absolutely inspire me. So uh, just kind of like one more question and then we're going to open it up to the, to the uh, Q&A. Um, but I, and if there aren't any from the audience, I have a thousand more. But um, to Ken and Julie, is there anything you're working on right now that like is really, really cool and should be in a movie? <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> I want to go first. Yeah, I'm going to just... get my pen out. <laughs> no, right. No, you go first. Or, I don't know. Movie wise. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, you know, because the types of things I'm working on relate to either climate controls, and so there's, there's a lot of potential there. But really what the public has been more engaged in my work is about radioactivity and when is it safe to be somewhere. And we did a lot of work after the Fukushima disaster six years ago now. Fortunate to go back two years ago to the Marshall Islands where we conducted purposeful nuclear weapons tests. And, and it's kind of interesting. They're asking at both of these sites the same questions. Is it safe to go back? They still can't answer that seven years later. 70 years later at the Marshall Islands, much less six years later in Japan. And so I am working with a production group in Boston. They're trying to think of principal pictures doing something with that. They were along on one of our cruises. Mm -hmm. You know, research, being on the ocean is kind of a cool thing. And so I think even though I don't work with charismatic megafauna and whales and things, I think there are stories that could be told around a legitimate research question that might I think, engage other audiences. So that's one example. Yeah, and I mean, my Enceladus example is a good one, right? And so in the last few years, especially here in Woods Hole, we've tried to bring space scientists closer together with ocean scientists because now some of the best targets in our solar system for finding life are um, moons that we think have oceans. So, um, you know, sometimes they might be under an icy shell or other times like Enceladus, there's just something being spewed out into space that we're catching with a flyby. And, you know, as ocean scientists, we go out in these ships and we're trying to detect and find life using advanced robotics, we're using telepresence, um, sometimes we're looking for life that's barely eking by. You know, and I think kind of connecting what we're doing in the deep ocean, the space scientists, it's very compelling, you know. Like I said, when we, when we stream these live videos and people ask, is this Earth? You know, they have already opened their imagination to it, you know, even before maybe many of us have. And so I think it's a, a wonderful, you know, it's exciting stuff. But being a storyteller, I hear her say that, and my brain immediately goes, immediately goes into overdrive because I start to think about <clears throat> if you can ask yourself maybe two or, the th or three <clears throat> of the most profound existential questions, it would be, you know, is there a god or gods? Is there, uh, are we alone in the universe? And, and where did we come from, right? Maybe those are the three most profound things we can ask ourselves. And what you're saying is that what you're doing might eventually lead to an answer to maybe two or three of those questions. Definitely not three, just to be clear. <laughs> <Two>. <laughs> <laughs> but if science can provide an answer to two of, the, of three of those questions, you know, and we can frame it that way, I think that's worth pursuing, both in continuing the work you do and in continuing the work that I do. Yeah. 